my name is Mary Dillenbeck, and I am a third year veterinary student at Texas A&M University. And today we're going to talk about parasites and their importance in veterinary medicine. So first off, we have to discuss what exactly is a parasite. The definition of a parasite is an organism that lives within or upon a different host species and may cause harm to the host. The important word being host. A brief discussion on the parasite life cycle. While parasites are very different, they all share similarities in their life cycle. If we begin with this diagram and you look at the these all parasites start out immature and go through a series of development. And in this example, we're using the heartworm. In this case, they develop inside the mosquito. After development, they have to begin with contact with the host and then gaining a suitable niche. Now, heartworms are kind of unique because being inside the mosquito, the mosquito actually transmits the heartworm to the dog through biting, and then once inside the dog, they travel through the bloodstream into the heart, where they begin the survival phase and develop and mature. Once they are mature inside the heart, they begin reproduction. And all parasites have some sort of reproductive product, whether it be a larvae, an egg, but once they have the reproductive product, it now has to be able to leave the host to infect new hosts. So you have to escape. In the case of the heartworm, this is done by the larvae traveling through the blood. And then when a mosquito bites and ingests blood, the life cycle begins all over again. Okay, so the easiest way to talk about parasites is to divide them into ectoparasites and endoparasites. Ectoparasites are those which live outside on the skin of the host. And these usually are either insects or arachnids, meaning ticks, mites, or spiders. And then endoparasites are parasites found within the body of the host. They can be in blood, in tissue, or in the gastrointestinal tract. These tend to be your nematodes, which are roundworms, trematodes, which are flukes, cestodes, which tend to be your flatworms, and protozoa, which are single-celled organisms. So who gets parasites? All animals get parasites, including birds, sheep, goats, even people get parasites. And it's a very important part that we have to deal with in veterinary medicine is control of these parasites since they infect so many of the animal species that we deal with. Or we'll begin by talking about ruminant parasites. While they have many different parasites, there are three main ones that we have to deal with. Those are the biting flies, liver flukes, and also intestinal parasites known as the barber's pole worm or homuncus. Biting flies are a real problem because of the irritation they cause the animals and damage they can cause to the skin. Liver flukes, just like the name says, live inside the liver and migrate through the liver. And this migration causes a lot of tissue damage and can actually be very difficult on the animal. And finally, the barber's pole worm, or homuncus, is a nematode that is found in sheep and goats and is particularly important here in Texas and is found in almost all small ruminants if you were to look for them. The next species we're going to talk about are horses. They're kind of unique because they have over 70 different species of parasites that can live in them or on them. One of the major ones we deal with is what's called a horse spot. These are actually fly larvae that live inside the stomach of the horse. That's where they develop. They can cause a lot of problems with colic, but are easily managed if you treat for them. The next one that we deal a lot with here in Texas is EPM, or equine protozoa myelitis. Now this particular parasite actually lives in the nervous system of the horse and migrates through nerves in the brain, so it can cause a lot of serious damage, including death in these animals. And the final parasite we worry about in horses is bloodworms or strongylus. They're another nematode that live in the intestinal tract, but they can also cause problems and blockages in horses leading to colic. The next group we're going to talk about are dogs and cats. Now this might be the one that you're most familiar with because we all have pet dogs and cats. One of the most common ones we deal with are fleas. And these are little tiny jumping insects that live on the skin of both dogs and cats. And they're a real problem because of resistance that they develop and they can infest your animal, your home, the carpet, and are very difficult to get rid of. They also transmit tapeworms, which is the second parasite we're going to talk about. 
These are flatworms that live in the large intestine of both dogs and cats, and they can be very annoying to owners when they find them. The next parasite that's common with dogs and cats is mange. Now this parasite's kind of neat because it's found either on or just below the surface of the skin, and if you look at the picture of the dog, that dog is obviously very uncomfortable and has hair loss from the mange. This parasite is also one that can be transmitted to humans and can cause itchy skin, so it's very important to try and control and prevent animals from getting it. Then the final parasite is heartworms. Like we discussed before, they're transmitted in the blood by mosquitoes. So now that we've had an overview of some common parasites in animals, how do we find these parasites? There's a few different ways that we can go looking for them. The first one is direct observation. When you have parasites like fleas or flies that live on the skin, it's very obvious. You see them and you know they're there. But sometimes it's a little more difficult. We have blood antigen tests and we can also do a direct blood smear to look for parasites that live in the blood. Since we can't see these with the naked eye, the tests are very nice because they come back instantly. Or we can just use a microscope to look at blood, and like the center picture shows, you'll see the little tiny parasites inside the blood cells. The next way that we look for parasites is through skin scrapings. That's the picture on the bottom right. That's a picture of a mite. To find these guys, we actually scrape the skin and then put the hair and skin onto a slide, look at it under a microscope, and you'll see the little tiny parasites. Now, for parasites that live in the gastrointestinal tract, we have to do fecal exams. We get a fecal sample, do a fecal flotation, look at it under a microscope, and you'll be able to identify the eggs, which is the bottom left picture, which is actually a hookworm egg under a microscope. Now, some t parasites are more difficult to find, and we actually have to do a biopsy of tissues, such as nerve or muscle, to look for the larvae inside the tissue. So why do parasites matter? First off, they cause a lot of production loss, especially in large animal species. They can cause disease and death in animals. And the final reason is zoonotic potential, which means they can be transmitted to humans. So first off is production loss. Now, like I said before, this is very important in large animals. Number one, because they cause annoyance to these animals. When flies are flying around and biting, animals don't want to eat, and if they don't eat, they aren't gaining weight. They can also cause serious problems with blood loss. Mosquitoes and biting flies can actually suck enough blood from a cow to cause anemia and even death in young animals. Um, intestinal parasites decrease the absorption of nutrients from the stomach. And so this can also cause animals to have poor growth and weight gain, which is a problem. And the final way that parasites can be bad for production loss is through damage to the hide or hair of the animal. When you're raising cattle, part of the money comes from the hide, and if you have a picture, like on the top, and cattle grubs that are crawling through the hide, this damages the hide and you lose value on the animal. Or if you have a wool-producing animal like sheep, it can actually cause their wool to fall out fall out so that you're not making money off of them that way. The next way that they can cause problems is through disease, and one of these, the major ways is through blood-related disease and death. As I discussed before, biting flies can kill an adult cow through blood loss, and then parasites such as heartworms can actually cause heart failure and death in dogs. You'll see from the picture that heart is full of worms and can no longer pump blood. Other parasites can cause disease and death through the nervous system. The picture on the top right is a worm that actually insists inside the brain. And depending on which part of the brain is infected, it can cause death through blocking the respiratory centers or the vascular centers in the brain, which control breathing and the heart. And then another very common parasite that people are familiar with is malaria. It is transmitted by mosquitoes, and it is responsible for more than one million deaths per year and is the number one killer of people in the world. Now, one thing we really worry about as veterinarians is zoonotic potential. 
Many animal parasites can also infect humans, and this is something we have to worry about with our clients. This slide shows the life cycle of the hookworm. It's very commonly found in dogs and cats. They're infected. It lives in their stomach and gastrointestinal tract. They then pass the eggs in their feces, which get into the soil, and the larvae develop in the soil. The problem is these larvae that live in the soil like to infect humans by crawling through your skin. So when you walk around barefoot, or you're playing in a sandbox that has these little larvae in it, these worms can actually penetrate your skin and they can cause problems like you see in the picture of the foot, which is a tract where the worm has migrated through the skin. They can also migrate to the eye and cause blindness. So how do we prevent parasites? There are very, very different methods used in large animal versus small animal. In small animal, most owners don't tolerate any parasites at all. If they see them, they want to get rid of them. Whereas in large animal, it's not economical or possible to prevent all parasites. Your aim is to minimize the parasite load to reduce your economic losses. So how do we do this? With small animal parasites, most people are very familiar with the prevention. You've seen the 1-800 pet meds, uh, got no fleas on me commercials, and these are all for common parasites that we have in animals. For ectoparasites such as fleas, there's all sorts of topical sprays and spot-on treatments and dips that you can use. For intestinal parasites, we use a monthly dewormer. It's usually included with heartworm pills that we give our dog every month to prevent heartworms. And as far as heartworms, you can give an oral pill every month, or there's also a choice to do a six-month injection. For large animal parasite prevention, it's a little bit more difficult. You can't go out and do a spot-on treatment on every single cow in a herd. So things such as spraying, dusting, and dipping are used to reduce ectoparasites, such as flies and ticks. We also use drenching, which is just giving oral medication for internal parasites. And it is important with large animals to use individual schedules and med medications developed for the number and type of parasites in an area. Not all parasites are the same. They can't all be treated the same. So it is important for people to know what parasites their animals have and use the proper medications on a proper schedule. Now, what about parasites in human medicine? Most people may not realize, but parasites aren't always bad. They can do some good. Early on in medicine, people began using leeches on humans. They thought it was a way to get rid of bad humor. And it, became, it came out of favor when we realized that bleeding people was not ideal, but it is being used again now to improve blood flow in surgery sites such as skin grafts and reattachments. The saliva actually produces an anticoagulant and the suction helps reduce edema in these areas so that the tissue can grow and heal. Another way that we're using parasites in medicine right now are with maggots. Now most people think maggots are gross and bad, but there are certain kinds of maggots that feed on dead necrotic tissue. So we have been using them to put into wounds, both in humans and in animals, and they can go in and microscopically clean out all of the dead tissue, leaving all of the healthy tissue behind so that it can heal faster. More parasite research is also currently going on with drugs and parasites. Recently, there have been no new introductions onto the market for parasite drugs. And so there is an increased number of parasites becoming resistant. This is very well documented in small ruminants, especially here in Texas. And we are trying to develop new routines and schedules to prevent parasites in these animals. But we've also recently discovered that it's becoming a problem in horses and cattle as well. Since we have no new anhelmintics on the horizon, we need to focus more on management practices and ways to reduce parasites that way, such as rotating animals through fields, spreading out manure piles and letting the sun dry them, and practices such as these. Now, you may be wondering, why can't we just develop a vaccine for parasites? It seems we have vaccines for everything else. 
The problem is parasite anatomy is actually very similar to mammal or animal anatomy. And so we've had a lot of difficulty developing vaccines that will attack a parasite but not harm the host. They're currently working on a vaccine for malaria, but it is still in development. That brings us back to malaria, which, like I said before, is the number one killer of people in the world. We are working on novel methods to control this parasite. The latest research to control malaria involves actually killing the mosquito, since that's how people get it. It works by introducing a fungus and bacteria onto the mosquito, which actually kills it before it is able to transmit the disease to humans. It's all very new and no one knows yet if it'll work, but it is an example of using alternative methods besides pesticides to control parasites.